Wireshark is a packet analysis tool that comes with Kali Linux and it can be installed on Windows, Mac, or Linux. To open a file with Wireshark, you can start by typing in Wireshark and then the name of the file. We have three files that we got from the NetRSec website, the makers of the network analysis tool called Network Miner. We have several packet captures available that you can use to practice. So to start with, we're going to open up the first packet capture. It can sometimes help to use the ampersand after you type in the command so that you don't lock up the terminal here while the graphical user interface is running. If you put the ampersand afterwards, it will background the process and then you can continue to use your terminal. When you open up the packet capture, you'll notice that the packets appear in the order they occurred by time. But you can resort those, such as by protocol or other fields. This can help you organize the packets. We can also scroll through the packets just to kind of get a feel for the types of packets there are. There's art packets, in other words, address or resolution protocol, DNS, web, NetBIOS name service, some encrypted SSL traffic, and then a lot of TCP traffic, and TLS version 1, the successor for SSL. It's helpful to sort by the different fields to get an idea of the conversations that were taking place and the types of traffic. If you sort by source, you're sorting by the IP address of the machine that initiated the communications or was sending the packet waiting for a response. Sorting by destination does the opposite. It's sorting by the machine that received the communications. So here we can see machine number 10 sent the network time protocol to a broadcast address and also machine 30 and 158 as an example. In addition to being able to sort, you can also use the filter to filter by certain packets. You can filter by the high-level protocol. For example, if you only want to see the DNS packets, you can type in the DNS filter and click apply or enter. You'll notice that when you have a valid filter, that the filter bar turns green. When you have an invalid filter, it turns red. Once you bring up the packet that you're interested in, you can start to look at that particular packet type more closely. You can see here that there was a DNS request that went out, and then there's also a DNS response. If you sort by time, we can put those in the correct order. So this packet went out first, and it was followed by this response. The middle area here contains information about the packet and the network stack. These have been parsed into readable format then in the bottom pane, you can see the raw format represented as hex and then also as ASCII. So for example, this DNS packet had a query, a type A query that asked to resolve the name at.atwallet.com. That actually resolved into a CNAME or an alias of glb-at.atwallet.adtechs.com. And then that furthermore resolved into two IP addresses. One was this 64.236.68.246 and then the other was this 245. These filters can do a lot more than search for just the top level protocol. It can take a little bit of time to learn the subfilters, in other words the child of the main filters, but it can help by using the middle pane and clicking on the line that you're interested in. So for example, if you wanted to filter by the name that came back in the DNS, you can see that if you highlight the line here and then look very carefully down here at this area, the item in the parenthesis is the display filter for that line. So this display filter is dns.resp for response dot name. So we now know that dns.resp is a valid object to filter on. And you can see that the context help will pop up when you type in a correct object and give you a hand with figuring out what the other filters are. So we could do dns.response.type, pull up all the packets that have that field available inside of them. You can also search for values on those fields. So for example, if you wanted to do dns.response.name, then you can do equal equal to mean equals exactly 
and you can try to do a search like that. And you can also do contains in some fields, which can be very handy. So for example, in this case, we did the DNS response name contains the letters AT. We already knew that at.atwallet.com was one of the filters. And we can also try an exact search and end up pulling up the same packet. Of course, we already knew that the packet contained that name because we looked earlier. But that's an idea of how to use the equal equals, the not equals, for example, and the contains. Not all packets can be searched by the contains field because the contains um, is only available when there's basically text. Sometimes some keywords can be used too, like you can string different filters together using and, or, and not logical operators. So and would be ampersand. And of course, this one doesn't make a lot of sense because of course DNS and DNS is always gonna find the packets that have DNS, but get the idea. And you can also use the or operator as well. So once you figure out how to bring up the different kind of packets you want, you can start to hone in on those type of packets. Like for example, we can filter for just the HTTP packets. And furthermore, some packet types, you can string back together the conversations that occurred. So on this HTTP, if we right click and say follow the TCP stream, then Wireshark knows how to parse through those different HTTP packets and reassemble the ones that are related in the same conversation. It'll put in a filter that'll bring those together, plus it'll open up a new window in which you can see the conversation. The red areas are the HTTP response that's going out from the client to the server. In this case, we can see we're getting a file that's in folder at a frame 3, uh, 5113.1, 221.794.0, quite the clever fil uh, folder there. And then it's looking for um, that file to come back and it's doing this on an HTTP 1.1 protocol and you can see the different header fields here. The blue area is the response that came back from that particular request. So we can see that what was returned was this HTML document here. Then another request went out to get another file and then another response came back and in this case the Content was actually some JavaScript to document that write. It's going to write some HTML when the JavaScript executes. You can save these out to a file. And for some of the high level protocols, things like voice over IP traffic, Samba sessions, sort of like server message block, for example, Windows file sharing, that sort of thing, and then also HTTP, you can export the entire conversations. So this can be particularly helpful if you are capturing browsing sessions to complicated web pages that have lots of graphics and images, JavaScript, cascading style sheets, and HTTP inside of them. You can export the entire conversation. So if you say export HTTP, Wireshark will bring up a list of the HTTP conversations that took place. You can click on one and save that conversation, or you can also just click save all and then provide a folder name. and Wireshark will save all of that information out to a folder name. This web browsing session wasn't particularly interesting. It didn't contain a lot of information. To practice something like that, use TCP dump to capture a conversation with a web page that has a lot of content on it. For example, go out and visit Yahoo or um, one of the news websites, and those are packed with all kinds of content and pictures, videos, and other information, and then that way you can get a a good um, practice on exporting the HTTP objects. Depending on the types of protocols that are in the packet capture, you'll have different features that are available and obviously different filters and searches that you can do. So in this case, 
we'll clear the current filter and then we'll do a search and see if we can find some packets that way. So one of the things to be aware of is that there's three different panels here. There's the packet list panel, the packet details panel, and then the packet bytes panel that we talked about earlier. And you'll see that the find packet wizard has those three searches built into it. Also, you can search by a display filter, a hex value, or a string. So you can use the displace filter here in the find packet window as well, in addition to the filter over here in the main panel. So if we wanted to search for a string like sans, we can do that in the packet list, the packet details, or the packet bytes. A lot of times it helps to search for hex using the packet bytes because that's where the hex is actually displayed. If we want to search for more of a string, like some kind of a keyword, a lot of times it's best to kind of search in the packet details because that's where keywords tend to be parsed out by the different parsers and displayed. So in this case, we're searching for the string sans inside of the middle pane. And we found some, at least one packet that has that in there. To get to the next packet, find next is control N or you can click edit and then find next and it'll go to the next packet that has that word in it. In this case, it's actually in the name field. So this is a net BIOS. And then like we said earlier, you can also filter based on the particular fields. So if you want to search by net BIOS ID field equal to that transaction ID, we can find all the packets related to this packet that have the same transaction ID. So you could do a display filter search. And of course, if you use the same search in the filter, the advantage is it'll just show you all the packets that match at the same time whereas the find box will find one packet at a time and then you can iterate through them. So here we can see four packets had that same transaction ID. You can also open packet captures by using file open if you already have the graphical interface running. So if we look at packet capture 2 for example, then we can see that there's different kinds of protocols in here. There's syslog, SMTP, which is also known as email, and then you have some ARP, some more NetBIOS name service, Internet Mail Format, DNS. The Internet Mail Format can be very interesting to look at because that's going to be email conversations. And those travel on top of the SMTP protocol. So we could have just as easily searched by the SMTP protocol and found these same internet mail formats because you can not only search by the protocol, the application layer protocol, the top layer protocol, but you can also search by the protocols that are carrying those. So either way would have pulled up those internet mail format messages. In this case, internet mail format is um, can be thought of as being carried by the SMTP protocol by looking at the stack here. So either we can look at the IMF packets or we can use that same trick from earlier about following the TCP stream and reassemble the conversation, essentially seeing what would be in the IMF packets anyway. You can do the reassemble for a lot of different kinds of protocols that are carried by TCP. So in this case, we can see that there are different kinds of um, commands going on from the client. So the client is talking to this email server, this ESMTP server, and it starts by sending in some login commands. So it's passing usernames and passwords that are base64 encoded. And then it starts with sending the email from the email address here in the mail from to the recipient. And then down below, you'll be able to see the different uh, messages that are in the body of the email. And finally, the email is sent. 
And when you run into some fields like that, uh, login that are base64 encoded, you can always decode that type of encoding and get that information back out. We can kind of tell this is base64 by either going out and looking at the protocol specifications, or in this case, we kind of got lucky because there's an equal sign at the end of the password field used as padding in base64. So chances are that's probably base64. Now data can still be encrypted within base64 encoding, so it doesn't always mean it's going to be clear text, but you can decode it and see if you can figure out what's in it. If we look at the IMF packets for this email, we'll see that a lot of the parsing has been done by Wireshark. So you can look at the different fields like the from and the to, but you're not getting quite as much information as what was in the raw SMTP. The reason is, is that in order for a field here to be populated, the parser that's doing the parsing has to have a parser built into it to pull that field out and display it here in the list. So sometimes it helps to look at the packets from a very high level, like the internet message format, but also look at it from the next level down and try to reassemble the conversation so you can see some of the pieces of information that are not necessarily parsed by the parsers. You can't really assume that every parser is going to parse every piece of information out of every protocol. It just was up to the person who wrote the protocol. You're allowed to write protocols for Wireshark and submit them. So if you find a parser that's not parsing as much information as you like, you can propose to add on to that protocol uh, parser and send it, send it into Wireshark. So going back to the SMTP, we'll see if we can decode some of that base64. And again, these are, these are all just examples. There's a lot of different kinds of protocols out there to look for. So this is the server saying that it wants a field value and it's base64 encoded. I have to put this information into a file first. And we can see that it was the word password. So that's the server saying it wants the password. Presumably this would be the server asking for the username. We'll skip that one. And we'll see if we can figure out what the username is and the password is. So the username is sneakygeek at AOL.com. And then we'll grab the password. And the password is 558 rules. So now we've seen how to look at various different kinds of protocol parsing, the filter feature, and the search feature, along with some sort features inside of Wireshark to help us get started on doing packet analysis.